So as pretty much everyone in the world knows that a couple weeks ago, um, Queen Elizabeth II of England, um, she passed away at the age of 96. Um, and, and there was one of those things, I'm not really, a, I'm not really a, a royals follower. I don't really know too much. I knew that her name was Queen Elizabeth. I knew that she was relatively old. And I also knew that um, what people would say about her is that she was pretty remarkable. I, obviously, in I, what I know about this is that there's not a whole lot of power that she would wield as the queen or uh, King Charles now as the king. Um, but it was an inter interesting thing how, how much people had talked about her virtues. They talked about her qualities, that, that what she was really like. And that, in fact, there was one author who said this. He said, she never made the mistake of thinking that she was an interesting or remarkable person in herself and thereby became remarkable. So she knew that she knew what she was. She knew who she was. She never made the mistake of thinking that she was a remarkable or interesting person in herself and thereby she became remarkable. That her, she realized that the whole, um, her whole situation, her whole life was an accident of birth or circumstance. Um, if you know any of her story, uh, which you probably do if you watch The Crown, um, is that uh, at one point when she was a child, her uncle abdicated the throne. And so her father became uh, King George VI. Her little sister at that point, I don't know, they were really young, asked her, Sister Margaret said, um, does this mean that you'll be queen someday? And she responded in a very British way. She said, I suppose it does. They never talked about it from then on. Uh, just kind of one of those, okay, matter of fact, at the age of 25, she became Queen Elizabeth II. And it was one of those situations where you realize that here she did this, she had this task that she lived for the next, you know, 70 plus years. She didn't seek out this life, that she didn't, um, pursue it. She just said yes when it came to her. That when it, when it came to her, she simply did what she was asked to do. And, and so that's, that's one of the things you could say, like all the things, all of the characters, all the qualities that marked her life, one of them, maybe the greatest, was you could simply say she did her duty. Like she did what was asked of her. No, of course, we would hear that and say, well, yeah, she was the queen. Oh, poor duty. But like I said, I remember another author had said this. He said, um, well, she did have good working conditions. And of course, you know, living in a castle and whatnot, palace. But every one of us have been in that place, right? We've been in that place where, okay, regardless of what the task is, I have to do the task. Regardless of, of, of how nice the conditions are, okay, I'm only here because I have to. I'm only here because it, I'm obliged to do this. I'm only, only, only here because it's, it is something I didn't ask to do. It's something that I didn't seek out. It's something that maybe I even don't want to do, but we had a duty. And here's the question. When that happens, when we have a duty, how do we do it? Like when we have something that we didn't choose, that I didn't want to do, that I didn't seek out, but it's come to me, how do we do that duty then? And I just want to ask the question, what's our response? What's our attitude? to something that we're merely obliged to do. That's right, in the gospel, Jesus even talks about this as a disciple who just simply does everything a disciple does. At the end of the day, you get to say, I've just done my duty, right? I've only done what I was obliged to do. So as a kid, when you had to do your chores, I know it for myself as a kid, when I had to do my chores, and I didn't want to do them, I just, my mom would always say this, you're, if I had to sweep, you're just pushing the dirt around, which is actually what sweeping is. but. Nonetheless, you're just pushing the door. You're not making it clean. We would vacuum a room and she's like, you vacuum for three minutes. It takes a lot longer to vacuum. Like, mom, you're just slow. But we would do this kind of thing as a kid or maybe even in your, in your work. If you don't like your work, if maybe at school, if you've been given busy work, how do we do those tasks that we have to do that are part of our duty that we're obliged to do that we don't want to do? I think the most common way we do that, we just kind of are half-hearted. I, th I think we might still do it, because I need to, I have to, but we just go through the motions. And again, that comes with our jobs. We can just go through the motions. When it comes to our relationships, you know, there might be people you're in a relationship with that just like, you don't want to be in a relationship with them, but they're part of your duty. They're part of the people you're obliged to be in a relationship with. And so we just go through the motions. In fact, when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, when it comes to our faith, so many of us, the way we live our faith is marked by, we're just going through the motions. And so the question comes between like, can I live with passion or can I just go through the motions? Like, can I live a life that's, that's full, of, that's full of life or do I just have to go through the motions? I think when we find ourselves going through the motions, we can feel stuck. It's, it's incredibly easy to feel stuck. Um, because why? Because I feel like I can't move and I want more. 
And I think that's what the apostles are asking for. At the very beginning of Luke's gospel today, what is it? Well, they walk up to Jesus and they say, increase our faith. Because why? Because my guess, again, I don't want to you know, project onto them, but there's that sense of like, okay, God, I have this, but I feel stuck. I don't want, I don't want to just go through the motions. I want more. Or even St. Paul to Timothy, when he says those first words, he says, stir into flame the gift that was given to you. Here's Paul who says to Timothy, I want more for you. Here's the apostles, I want more. I don't want to be stuck. Here's Paul looks at Timothy and says, you need more. Don't be stuck. The great thing is, is this, is that both of these things, both the request to increase our faith and the injunction, stir into flame, the gift you've been given, it implies that we don't have to stay stuck. It implies that we actually, that faith is alive, that faith is something we can actually grow, that if you feel stuck, you can actually do something about it. Not only because we have God's grace, but also because you have agency. And this is one of the Christian principles. And so we have God's grace. God wants more for us. So if you are the kind of person, go back to ourselves. If you're the kind of person who says, okay, I, I'm living this life of faith, life of faith, but I just feel like I'm just going through the motions. I feel stuck. Can I grow? Is there more? That God wants more. Secondly, you have agency, which means you can do something to grow. You can do something to increase your faith. You can do something to stir into flame the gift that the Lord has been giving you. You can actually choose to stop going through the motions and you can actually choose to start growing through the motions, which I know is a pun and I apologize, but that's the name of the series we're gonna do for the next four weeks. For the next four weeks, we're gonna talk about this because too many Christians, too many Catholics are, are we're tired. We're tired of just going through the motions. In fact, this is for everybody. This series, the next four weeks is for everybody, but it's especially for those who are raised in the church. People who are like, you know, I know all the motions. <laughs> like, I know all the moves. I know all the lines that I, I've got it all down. And I still feel stuck. And I still feel like those apostles are just saying, isn't there more? Please increase my faith. I feel, still feel like Timothy, who's like, okay, I've been given this gift, but now I just feel like I'm going through the motions. Well, we're going to talk over the next four weeks of what it is to not simply go through the motions, but to grow through the motions. So whenever I think of this, whenever I think of going through the motions, I always think of the, the movie, The Karate Kid. Okay, so I know there's two of them. And so I know that the first one is when I was a kid. And maybe the second one was when you guys, you watched The Karate Kid ever? Okay, so the, okay, here's the premise. Daniel, in the original one. Daniel, he moves from New Jersey out to Reseda, California. He gets beat up for, by, by some bullies. And then he meets Mr. Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi knows karate. And so he's gonna teach Daniel's son, that's what he calls him, uh, teaches him karate. But the first thing he does is he has him uh, paint a fence, right? And then he has him wax his cars and he has to wax on and then wax off. And then he has to sand the desk, uh, the, sand the deck, right? So he does all these tasks for him. And at the end of the day, at the end of the whole time, Daniel is rel relatively frustrated because he's doing all these, all these seemingly meaningless tasks with no point. And uh, he yells at Mr. Miyagi, like, I'm doing all this menial work for you, all this meaningless work for you. And that's where Mr. Miyagi says, okay, you know, paint the fence. And he's like, what do you mean paint the fence? So he so paints the fence and he moves it and he punches and he blocks the, blocks the punch and he's like, oh my gosh. And then whacks the floor and, or sand the floor and he sands and he blocks a kick and he's like, oh my gosh, I've been learning karate this whole time. I literally, this is a true story. I, after I watched this movie, I went home and I was begging my mom, mom, do you have any Thing I can sand? Like, can I paint the walls here at all? Can I, can we wax, do we have any turtle wax to wax the cars? I was begging her to do chores because I figured, like, that's chores equal karate. This is like very highly transferable in the skill. Um, I learned that not only does it not transfer, but also I don't like chores. Anyways, back to our story. Um, in reflection, obviously, one doesn't learn karate. This would not work in real life. I know it's a shock. I apologize to reverse the bubble. But why wouldn't it work? First, because we're lazy <laughs> as human beings and Mr. Miyagi wanted Daniel to uh, paint the fence in exactly the precise way that you might actually block a punch. He wanted to wax the car in the exact way. You'd block a whatever. Um, we're lazy, we get sloppy. The second reason is because Daniel, Daniel didn't know the point. He was told just to simply paint a fence to wax a car to sand the, de the, the, the deck. He didn't know the point. And without knowing the point, all of our tasks, no matter what they are, are simply meaningless work with no worthy goal. And I think that's the truth, true for us as well. Like all the stuff that we have to do, all the stuff that we need to do, it's obliged to us. Sometimes they can feel to us like meaningless, meaningless tasks for no good reason. And therefore it feels like empty work, it feels like meaningless work. Not meaningful work oriented towards a worthy goal. 
And if, the, if this is us, then, then duty, we talk about duty, duty feels like slavery. And going through the motions is a trap. That's only the case if what we're doing in our day is merely duty. If, all, if what we're doing in our day is merely work, is merely a task. It's, if, it's, if it's only what we're obliged to do, because that idea of just only living for duty is a recipe for burnout. To only live for, for going to go through the motions is a recipe for discouragement. I just keep doing it, I keep doing it, I keep doing it, and I keep going through the motions with my with mass, I keep showing up and going through the motions and at prayer, I keep showing up and going through the motions. And I and in whatever I keep showing up and going through the motions and I don't grow. And so we have that cry of the apostles, Lord, increase our faith. So the solution, potential solution, avoid duty. <laughs> Just stop, stop doing whatever you're obliged to do. Not a good solution. I don't recommend that one. It's tempting, but we realize that duty is not the enemy at all. In fact, we know this, the truly heroic among us are often those who didn't do the heroic thing because they felt heroic in the moment, but because they just said, it was what I had to do. I was reading a number of stories recently, you know, last September, um, about people at 9-11 who just were on gro at ground zero. These are ordinary people who happened to be there when the, the towers were hit, who ran into the buildings. And many of them died, but those who lived, they were asked about, like, how did you, what kind of person are you? You must be this great hero. And almost to a person, every one of them said, I'm not a hero. I simply did what I had to do. I simply did what anyone would do. I simply did my duty. See, we, we really admire people who are willing to do something not just because they had, were passionate about it, but because they realized someone has to do it and that someone is me. We respect people who do that. We respect people who show up because they're obliged to. Duty is not the enemy. Duty is the minimum, according to the gospel today. Duty is the minimum, but also we need to understand this. Duty is not the point. Going through the motions is not the point. Mere, mere duty is meaningless work with no real purpose. It's simply going through the motions. But here's the problem. The motions are not the problem. The truth is, the motions are not the problem. Our perspective is the problem. After all, like, what is faith? The apostles, again, in us, we ask the Lord, increase our faith. And we could ask the question, okay, well, you're asking for more. What do you want more of? We realize that faith isn't an object, right? Faith is, is, isn't a thing. It's not like, it's not like fuel, like, um, God, give me more uh, in, my, in my faith tank, like give me more in my gas tank. Ultimately, faith is trust. Ultimately, fa ultimately, faith is trust in another, which means that faith is relational. Faith is a relationship. It's not a thing to possess. It's, it's the relationship we have with God. When we realize this, it's not a thing I just need more of. It's a relationship that needs to become stronger. It's not just a thing that I want to possess more of, but it's, not, it's a relationship that needs to be deeper. That's why faith is not a feeling. This is so important for us to understand because the apostles are not asking, Lord, increase our faith. Help us feel more when we're around you. They felt fine. St. Paul is not telling Timothy, I want you to stir into flame the feeling you have of closeness to God. That's not what he asked for. He actually, remember what he asked for? He said, stir into flame the gift that was given to you because you didn't receive a spirit of timidity. You received a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. See, again, one of the things we need to understand is the question is not what does faith feel like? The question is what does faith do? What does this relationship do in my life? It's one of the reasons why I think that some of the most spirit-led, most powerful, loving and self-controlled people that I've ever met in my life are exorcists and, and the laymen and laywomen who work with exorcists. And you'd be like, of course you, that they are because, I mean, they must be especially gifted. They must be especially talented. They must be especially holy. And some of them are very gifted. I, I met one exorcist who literally has a, um, a photographic memory. He has a photographic memory and an audiographic memory, audiographic, photo, photo audio. He can, he can recall everything he's ever read and everything he's ever heard. He's just remarkable. That's, that's talent. That's not holiness. We can sometimes think that those people who work in these ministries are exceptional. And they might be, but they didn't show up exceptional. They became exceptional. How? Well, they became exceptional by showing up and doing what was asked of them. I don't know if you know this, but someone doesn't volunteer to be an exorcist. They get asked to be. Someone doesn't volunteer to be a lay person, a lay woman or a lay man on the exorcism team. They get asked to be. Kind of like the queen, right? 
She didn't seek out, hey if, you, hey, if you're not doing anything, uncle, you can abdicate so I can be the next queen. She didn't seek it out. It was given to her. She was, call, it was, she was called upon to do this. All those exorcists, all those people who work in that area, they're obliged to serve the church in this particular way. And what do they do? They simply, they don't do exorcism because they're passionate about it. They simply show up and they pray the prayers the church has given. I mean, this is remarkable. They simply show up. And with this person who is bound by demons, bound by Satan, they simply show up and they pray the prayers that the church has given them. And now those aren't incantations, right? It's not like they you just say these words. They pray these prayers, but they have to pray them in faith. Like, right? They have to pray them, not feeling close to God. They have to pray them knowing, trusting that God hears their prayers and is going to do something. Why are they some of the, as I said, most, some of the most powerful, loving, self-controlled people, most spirit-filled people, not because objectively they're holier than anyone else, but because on a daily basis, they show up and they say the exact same prayers you and I pray on a daily basis, but they pray them in a very unique way. I mean, think about the way you and I typically pray when we're going through the motions. We might show up and just say, okay, I've got to pray my rosary today, so here we go. I'm just going to Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I'm going to go. Here I am showing up for Sunday Mass. I'm just going to pray, genuflect. I know the moves, as I said, and sit there and just go through the motions. I don't feel anything. Okay, that's not the issue. The issue isn't, should I be passionate or should I go through the motions? The issue is, how am I praying these prayers? Those people who deal with exorcisms on a daily basis, they realize that I show up and I pray these prayers and I need to trust that God will act or else I'm toast. <laughs> they're, they're pushing on a daily basis the very limits of their faith, trusting that God will do something to heal, to deliver this person in front of them. Years ago, there was a scientist named um, Anders Ericsson. Anders Ericsson, he, uh, he studied people who were experts in, in their field. And he came down to, his, his, his research was popularized by a man named Malcolm Gladwell. And he came to this conclusion that a person can only become an expert if they put in at least 10,000 hours of work. So if you want to become an expert in anything, the idea was, kind of proposed to the world, was that you have to put in at least 10,000 hours of work, 10,000 hours of practice. So in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, he talks about uh, how the Beatles, uh, that before the Beatles became on the, came on the world stage at all, they had at least 10,000 hours of practice. They would practice in bars and practice, they would perform, they want practice, they would perform in bars and all these other places around England. And by the time they made it big, they were experts. Same thing with uh, Bill Gates and Bill Joy, these computer programmers, that they started programming when they were in their early teens, so that by the time they were in their early 20s, they were experts in this field of programming. So it was this kind of idea, right? The concept that grabbed people's imagination, grabbed their kind of, captured them and said, okay, I want to be an expert, 10,000 hours. Here's the issue. It's not just simply 10,000 hours. It's 10,000 hours of a certain kind of practice. It's 10,000 hours of a certain kind of living. It's what they call 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. So I had started playing the guitar, I think almost 30 years ago. And I am as good at the guitar, sorry, I am worse at the guitar now than I was my second year of learning how to play the, how to play the guitar. But I've been playing regularly for the last 30 years almost. Why? Because when I pick up a, when I pick up a guitar, I now pick up and play the songs that I like playing. When I was first learning the guitar, I was pushing the edge of my ability. I, I was pushing the limits of my ability. I was going through the scales, I was going through the motions, learning the chords, learning how you, where you put your fingers when you pluck, all these things I was learning and it was pushing me. And I got to a certain level and then I just stayed there. And so now when I pick up the guitar, I simply go through the motions. And the motions that I know, the motions that I'm comfortable with, the motions I'm familiar with, and I'm as good or slightly less than I was as a senior in college because I just go through the motions. But if we're going to be people who are walking in faith, if we're going to be people who are growing through the motions, that means our prayer has to be a certain kind. It means it, it's not just, okay, I'm going to show up and say my prayers. It means I'm going to show up and I'm going to say my prayers at the very limits of my ability. I'm going to show up and say my prayers like that exorcist or those lay people that work with the exorcists who realize, 
Okay, we are relying upon God every time we recite the Our Father. We're not just kind of sort of saying the Our Father. When we call upon Mary's intercession, we're not just kind of sort of praying the Hail Mary or praying the Rosary. We show up for Mass. We're not just showing up and kind of just hanging out here while holy things happen around us. What we're doing is we're engaging this saying, God, if you are not here, I'm dead. But God, you are here, so how much more deeply can I lean into you? See, this is the thing. The emotions are not the enemy. And it's not a question of, are you going to do this with passion or are you going to go through the motions? We grow. We grow when we go through the motions and put our whole heart into it. And this is the last thing. We only grow when we go through the motions and put our entire heart into it. I'm Queen Elizabeth. Um, one of the things that made her great was that she chose to go through the motions. She chose to say yes to her duty. But she did it in a unique way. She seemed to uh, do it in a way that looked like it mattered that she showed up. She did it in a way that seemed to make it look like she believed that it was worthwhile. She did it. She said yes to her duty, not necessarily because she was passionate about being the queen or because she was passionate about the duties that a queen would perform. But she showed up and she went through the motions of being the queen like her heart was in it. And this is the place of growth. Not choosing between passion and going through the motions, but growing through the motions by doing the motions themselves with our whole heart in it. Because why? Because these motions, these tasks, these things that we're doing, they are meaningful tasks and they're oriented toward a worthy goal. That's the only way, that's the only way anything that we do here, from prayer to mass, to showing up and going through the motions, that's the only way that what we do here will make saints. This deliberate practice, this pushing the very limits of our faith is the only thing that will grow our faith.